Hello. Um, so in this video, I would like to talk about a topic that seems to be becoming quite popular in creativity research and uh, cognitive and neuroscientific research. It's a specific sub-branch interest that um, I've seen many YouTube lectures based on and several uh, papers written on. They're sparing, but they're growing with uh, frequency and regularity. And, tip, and particularly this topic is the question, can genius be taught? Um, it's a branch of the question of what is genius? And I've said in other videos, I don't know what is what a genius really is or what that means, but this question, can genius be taught? There is there's two main stances on it, yes and no, obviously, I think most people would assume, but it's the yes and the no's, why people choose to say yes and why people choose to say no, which I don't agree with. I Personally, I am going to lay down an argument for why I don't believe genius can be taught, but I am going to criticize both standpoints, at least from what I hear when people say, uh, no it can't, and yes it can. I will start with the no it can't because I fall under that camp, but I don't agree with what I'm hearing from others within that camp. Others within that camp, they simply bring the question of genius down to um, profound skill and ability. So I don't know why in the 21st century after the um, publishing of uh, Keandre Erickson's research and so many other, Scott Barry Kaufman and so many other researchers who have looked into um, talent, performance, skill, and intelligence and accepted that when you're looking at somebody who has profound abilities, it's due to deliberate practice with it. That's, there's a significant percentage of what you're seeing that's due to practice, period. Um, it doesn't matter the person's age, it doesn't matter the person's um, occupation it, or domain of knowledge, that what you're seeing in performance, because performance and IQ, they don't have a direct correlation. This has been tested uh, before. They don't have a direct correlation, so when you're looking at profundity of ability, you're looking at profundity of discipline and skill, practice. Um, that's what it boils down to, and uh, that's why I wanted to start there briefly, because that's all I've heard. It seems to be uh, romantic notions of the idea of genius, and this may seem like hearsay or just a idiosyncratic observation, which most of my observations are very idiosyncratic in nature, but I just noticed that there is this trend in scientism, or just in the field of science and cognitive research, that... Uh, the romantic notion of genius and how geniuses represent um, some sort of religious ideological uh, figure for uh, many scientists and researchers and I think that's silly and um, something that needs to be overturned. I'm not going to talk about that much more but I, I see that as the motivation for many of these arguments. They want to protect somewhat of the sacred cow and continue to hold the idea of genius in a higher uh, mystic cloud than it really is. There are plenty of things that are mysterious about the phenomenon of genius, but the profundity of ability and skill is not one, and that's one that they typically cite. I mean, if you see somebody doing something and they appear even divine and almost deistic in their actions, they worked for that in some manner, in a very significant manner. So, moving on, now I will turn the main uh, thrust of my attention to the yeses, and why I don't agree with the yeses. So, one thing that anybody who says genius can be, can be taught is that genius boils down to creativity. Um, yes, geniuses are highly creative individuals, um, because according to many researchers, and even just to my own um, 
observations and uh, opinion. It's what somebody does that makes them a genius, not their IQ per se, and, and uh, not their um, personality or their... It's an amalgamation of things that make somebody a genius, but primarily it's coming up with creative insight or seminal work. It's what an individual does and produces that makes them a genius, not just a IQ. Genius is a state of being that's evident through actions. It's not um, just cognitive capacity or creative capacity in of itself. And, but what um, most people who are saying, yes, a genius can be taught, are saying that because creativity can be amplified, you can take the um, models, tools, skills, and mental representations that geniuses have created to produce their work and teach those to somebody else and that person use them and gain the same ability and um, I suppose potentiality. So two problems I have with that is genius is not solely creativity and it's not solely potentiality. It's not what one could possibly do and it's, it's not just being able to come up with things. Um, creativity is a very complex phenomenon, but it's not the entire picture of what makes someone a genius. Um, there are factors that extend outside of the individual that determine whether or not they will be a genius, particularly uh, region and location, the community that surrounds them, um, the status of the domain of knowledge that they're uh, in because creativity is domain specific and so if creativity is domain specific a highly seminal creative insight is going to be domain specific so you have to look at the genius they're steeped in a community which is within a specific geographical location within a specific domain and these things are going to lead somebody to become a genius or at least with the other character traits that the person has present the domain is what they're going to express them through. If they do not have the domain, if they don't have the community and the peers around them, and if they don't have the geographical location per se, then they won't be considered or become a genius. Um, and it's also to say this, that problems, you don't get to pick the salient and relevant problems in your field. They emerge over time given the pre-existing structure of the field and where it's advanced to the stages of time where the individual rests at. Meaning that when, for example, in physics, because of Newtonian mechanics and because of relative relativity and because of quantum mechanics, we are where we are right now in the problems of physics. If Newtonian mechanics hadn't been constructed the way it had been, and conceived by, conceived as by Newton, same thing with uh, relativity and quantum mechanics, we would not be having the problems of rec reconciling quantum mechanics with relativity and quantum mechanics with classical mechanics and classical mechanics with relativity and making them have this all harmonious conversation. This uh, difficulty in synthesizing the major theories in physics are a result of the thinking that preceded are now. The past says something about the present. And so when you're looking at problems, it's typically, when you're looking at genius, it's typically uh, great problems that help shape the genius. And so um, that's the first issue I take is just that so often when we're using the word genius, we're using it as a um, segre segregating word and treating it as a um, Action, I, I mean, not an action, because it is what one does, so it is somewhat of an action, but it's not just what somebody thinks. And um, it's not merely what somebody can do, it's actually what they do, and even what somebody does, it's dependent on more than just themselves. Uh, no one's in a vacuum, not even a genius, so that's the first problem I have with it with the uh, yes. Um, the second is is just that uh, the people, okay, I just noticed this bent in uh, Western culture is that people think once you can abstract something or delineate it and pin it down that 
once you figure out a way to um, package it in a, in a sort of way and um, make it administrable and accessible, accessible to a multitude of people, that it will make the phenomenon ubiquitous. It, it won't no longer be rare. And they assume genius isn't a rare, phenom a rare phenomenon because they assume you can teach creativity first. It's based off of a previous assumption that you can teach creativity and that genius boils down to creativity, which I don't believe you can teach creativity. I don't believe you, you uh, genius boils down to creativity. And so I definitely don't believe that just even if those things are true, that you can get genius to be a more uh, frequent occurrence because it is something like a phenomenon. When you have a genius, it's like an event because there's it's an individual and their relation to a community and a problem and a certain nexus point in history. And this profound result emerges from all these things kind of coming together. That's just, that's rare. And part of the reason it is rare is because uh, one thing I noticed that the people who say yes it, it say is they say yes because they believe creativity can be taught ultimately and they believe genius boils down to creativity. Well, genius doesn't boil down to simply creativity. And you, I don't care what genius you look at, they have a high level of intelligence. And intelligence and creativity are necessary to be a genius. You need both to be a genius. And it's this that leads me to say that just because you teach somebody the tools of a genius doesn't mean they're suddenly going to become one because um, intelligence and creativity, having high levels of creativity and high, having high levels of intelligence have something to do with um, exposure, IQ, um, and just uh, innate uh, physiological factors. I mean... Um, creativity just as much as IQ seems to uh, have a bell uh, shaped curve at least that's what some propose and at least to my lay experience and just what I when I what I see in a domain of knowledge that seems to be the case I'm not saying that that's empirically exact or right but that just seems to be the case um, it could be disproved later and I'm always open to change my opinion but it's just to say that creativity and intelligence they seem to be running on spectrums um, they seem to be running on diverging spectrums, not convergent ones. Um, you can look at the research on uh, neurophrenology, how somebody's brain is actually made up when they're highly intelligent, and look at how somebody's brain is made up when they're considered highly creative. And somebody who's highly intelligent has a very um, powerful uh, frontal region of the brain. Their um, executive region of the their executive networks, their executive functions are just robust and powerful. There's a, a, a dense amount of gray matter and white matter fidelity within the prefrontal cortex. But when you look at somebody who is highly creative, it's the exact opposite. They're very um, skim insofar as they're loose and transient. It's there is such a there's such a low um, there's such a low uh, volume and thickness of gray and white matter. There is less integrity amongst the cortical structures, and it seems to be that this leads to uh, a greater level of association and ideas. And it leads me to say that intelligence and creativity, high levels of intelligence and high levels of creativity, are somewhat antithetical to one another. They're just contradictory in some way. And so when you have an individual that comes around and they have this sort of neurophonology where they have both, um, Einstein, he had a... Uh, Sorry, I'm blanking on the I'm blanking on the um, name. Uh, the corpus callosum. He has such a robust and large corp corpus callosum. It was quite strange to many researchers. It, um, just his entire neurophonology was strange to many researchers. Some of it can be um, noted to deliberate practice, but other pieces of his uh, actual neurophysiology are just quite strange. And I don't. I mean, I don't know what any of that stuff means because I'm not real. I'm not a neuroscience major or cognitive science major. I read a copious amount of the literature and a copious amount of psychological literature. I'm a thinker, but you know what Einstein's um, corpus callosum? What made Einstein's corpus callosum that size? I don't know, and I don't know any researcher that does. But I'm saying this that.
when you get somebody who's highly creative and highly intelligent at the same time, that's a rare thing. Just period in in an individual because of biology. Just it seems like because there's constraints, nature is conservative. It just seems like there is natural constraints in how a person's brain can be arranged. It's why savants seem to um, savantism is the uh, sort of um, phenomenon. It is because when you uh, allocate so many, uh, just I would say so much protein and resources and genetic material to making one side or one ability of something robust, it seems to be a zero-sum game. You can't have it all. Nobody can have it all. Um, so it's just to say that, you know, even if you got people these uh, tools that these uh, proponents of, that these tools that um, the proponents of Genius Being Taught have collected, and are trying to disseminate in uh, books and media, even if you collect these and house these all in, a, in an individual, doesn't mean you're going to get the res, the same result. doesn't mean you're going to get an Einstein or uh, Euler or Gauss or Newton or Feynman or whoever you want to pick. It's just, you're not going to get Henry David Thoreau. You're not going to get Ralph Waldo, Ralph Waldo Emerson. They're individuals for a reason. I mean, I, I know I said earlier that uh, genius is often used to um, segregate people, and it would sound from the way I'm speaking that I hold these men men to be, um, I suppose, uh, deistic entities. Uh, but I don't. They're just they're people who are born and with a certain neurophonology in the right time period. They're just lucky in some respects. It's that's all it is, and there's, so there's some luck to being a genius, I don't, you know, it's, I don't, I suppose I don't quip at this or get too disturbed by it, because there are people who are taller than me, um, height and, uh, male attractiveness have a correlation, because women like tall guys, it's, I'm not very, I'm not very short, but I'm not very tall either, um, just physical appearance, we know physical appearance, uh, weighs into how, people treat one another. Man, there's, I don't look like uh, George Clooney or Brad Pitt or anything like that. It's just any trait that you're talking about, whether you're talking about physical attractiveness, whether you're talking about creativity, whether you're talking about intelligence, whether you're talking about height, anything that's an embodied trait that it seems like people are concerned with and prize, there is just going to be uneven distributions of it because nature is pretty dang um, random in its selection. So... That's, uh, again, I don't have a problem with that because it just seems to be the way things work. Um, also, you know, there is a woman talking, and I can't re remember her name exactly, but because I, I pulled this from looking at a set of old notes that I wrote when I was watching this video, and I thought, I, I should probably make a video about this because this is something that I, I see a lot of people talking about, and making comments and statements on and but um when she was talking she was talking oftentimes about uh ch one changing their frame of reference and uh the assumptions that people seem to make and i promise that the uh the thing about assumptions everybody makes assumptions one you cannot get to any um Found, you cannot produce any structure of knowledge if you don't start with assumptions. I'm sort of, I'm somewhat of a epistemologist because I'm an INTP. I do care about. I'm very concerned with knowledge structures and how they emerge. And I notice just by my own, just by my own observations, that it doesn't matter if something's true or not, whether something is true or false. There are assumptions that underlie it that make that conclusion possible, whether it has an um, empirical. Uh, validation to it or it doesn't there's still an assumption within the network of the system of investigation or the system of uh philosophy that leads to x conclusion which can be either true or false the whether it's true or false has something to do with the assumptions made um may have more to do with the premises and the premises aren't necessarily the sum the assumptions because Somebody's assumptions, they're very hard to pick out. They're not necessarily the uh, premises or the postulates or the axioms because 
how you get those premises, postulates, and axioms in the first place is through uh, intuition. And so I want to talk about intuition just briefly here. It seems like human intuition is constructed from memory and experience. It's some form of expectation. You you know, and so when she's talking about assumptions, she was talking about this, and she was talking about an experience that she had going into a dinery, uh, a New York dinery, and the she uh, called over the waitress, and she ordered something, and the waitress said, go into the kitchen and get it yourself. She said she was shocked, which, you know, that can be shocking, because I think she was from Maine or some place like that. So she had never been to New York, and she never encountered anything like that. I've lived in Manhattan. I mean, like, that wouldn't surprise me. Um, so somebody said something like that in New York. Because, again, it's leading to expectation. But she took and made a serious jump from that experience to saying, this is what assumptions do to all people, that they um, restrict our vantage point and our view and expectations and what to look for in the environment. And that has some... That has some semblance of truth. I'm not saying that that doesn't have semblance of truth, because as an INTP, if anybody has argued against me, they realize how quickly and how easily I go after their assumptions and shoot them down, because people assume asinine things very often. But I would say this, that just because assumptions led you to a bad place doesn't mean nobody makes assumptions and that you don't need to make assumptions to get to conclusions. You have to make assumptions. I mean, you're human. You have to make assumptions by the mere fact that reality is too dang complex for you to be able to uh, consciously and rationally analyze it and understand the complete nuances and details of the system. You can't do it, so you have to make some assumptions. There are some places where you're standing in the dark, and you are because our primary role in reality is to act, you need to start somewhere, so you better assume something. And if you're going to base your assumptions off of anything, your expectations and what you've seen occur in the environment over time makes just as much sense as anything else. So, again, there's a bit of chance and luck involved in that and the assumptions that a, a person makes. But I'll say this. You can make an assumption, and it can be very powerful. Just assume you don't know what to expect and see how <laughs> see how less shocking that situation that that woman was in would be. And I do that all the time with people. I just assume I don't know what the hell to expect from this person. So it actually keeps me from getting in a lot of conflict with people or being disappointed. Because I don't, I assume all the time I don't know what's going on or I don't know what to expect. I don't, and I don't know if you're going to hear a person say, I don't know as much as you hear me say, I don't know. But that's just an ex, that's an assumption I make that I don't have all the facts to something. And I can't possibly have all the facts to something at one time. And if I don't have the necessary distance and um, time period to analyze what's going on, there is no possible way I'm going to be able to come to the complete, accurate description of what something is. That's why I'm slow in deliberation, and it takes me forever to make a decision. It's not because I'm just lazy or something. It's because, dang it, I don't know. Like, I don't understand what's going on. And I couldn't possibly understand and know what's going on if I don't take and do this. So get out of my way and let me do it. But just the to the point of uh, that all assumptions are uh, bad and that people need to go around tweaking and reworking their assumptions all the time. No, you don't need to do that. If you find the right assumptions to make, they're, they're pretty dang powerful and they work. It's, you know, I, I don't agree with that. And then if we want to talk about, um, and I know all the other things, points I was saying they assume this they assume that but I'm saying that you do need to make assumptions you can make some very fallacious assumptions but it's to say if you want to protect yourself from uh, making just the incorrect assumptions go be adventurous and take in experiences because your assumptions and your intuition are shaped strongly by uh, your experiences they're another form of expectation if you know this and you're concerned with being more creative just expose yourself to more things. I mean, that's it's that simple. Just don't assume you know what's going on in a situation, and I'm, I promise you, you'll be much more creative in um, some regards. Mm, okay, and so the other, and I touched on this briefly, so this will be the last point, and I touched on this briefly, but it's this other assumption that, okay, if you can, if you can figure out what Einstein did, if you can figure out what Newton did, if you can figure out how Ga Gauss and Euler 
and um, Vermont, and um, I'm saying these names because those are the ones I uh, typically dealing with and studying. I mean, or you take Dostoevsky, or or you take uh, Shakespeare, or you take um, Thoreau, you take uh, Hitchens. No, I didn't. Sorry, I didn't mean Hitchens. I meant Hume and uh, Locke and Kant. And you can figure out why they said what they said and for what reasons. And same with Nietzsche. Or any, just take anybody you think is a genius and put them in this category of one I can analyze. And I'm sure you can analyze them. And I'm sure you can abstract their tools and their means of getting to where they got, the means of how they got to the conclusion that they got to. But there are so many differing factors that are going on in the background of that person being able to come to that conclusion that you can't duplicate or replicate for anything. A primary thing is motivation. I mean, if you're going to solve a, an unsolved problem in a domain of knowledge, if anybody, I mean, if anybody who's watching this works in um, engineering or math or any science, even law or any of the humanities, anything, you know, that we, that's been around for quite a while or music, try doing something that is at the very reaches of the domain of knowledge, as in that they're, um, if not impossible or if not completely opaque, mostly impossible and mostly opaque, meaning that where we are presently standing at in time, we have just not done, we just have not collected the relevant um, facts and knowledge to get to how we should deal with this thing. And our prior underlying systems of knowledge aren't complete insofar as they're not contained with the correct propositions and facts that we could therefore base um, our uh, opinion and um, pro future processes on to get an accurate result from doing so. It's to say that the prior knowledge isn't complete and the knowledge where we're at isn't an, isn't, hasn't been aggregated enough, so this thing that's over here, it's really hard to access. I mean, I just want to stress the difficulty of this because it's really hard. I don't know what people um, think. It's, man... It's like, it's it's hard. It's just very, very difficult. That's why a genius in of itself, because it has something to do with dealing with these problems, is going to be something that's very, very difficult to attain for any person. It doesn't even matter, because Edward Witten is somebody, I think, who is highly creative and highly intelligent. I don't think he's a genius, because he hasn't solved the uh, great problems of, that are uh, plaguing physics right now. I mean... At least, and I'm not trying to degrade Ed, uh, Edward's Witten's status in uh, in physics and say that his work isn't um, important, but it's just not seminal. It's not genius. It's because that's hard. I mean, I don't care if you come with, uh, you know, all the uh, knowledge in the world. Well, maybe if you came with all the knowledge in the world. So yeah, that's a that's a rash. Um, that's an extreme, and I'm I shouldn't say that but I'll say this that it's the reason it's hard is because of human limitations because there's a bound in space proximity and time in determining whether or not somebody will become a genius also your community and the um, problems that actually exist at the time not every problem can be s problems when you have new problems the thing is they can't be solved like the ones that preceded before them that's another reason why it's really, really, really hard. You can't do it the same. It doesn't fit with everything else that's currently going on. That's, I don't know if anybody is picking up and how many times I have to repeat that it's hard. I suppose I'll say it till I'm blue in the face, but man, if you don't realize how that puts an enormous amount of strain and difficulty on the uh, process or just the um, sort of, excuse me, the... Uh, Chances of somebody being a genius or a genius appearing, man, I don't know what can what will make I don't know what will make that clear, but um, it's it's this that you've got the problem, so that puts a that puts a, a constraint on how frequent it's going to be, and then you have the problem of expertise too. 
and that's not a problem insofar as a uh, external problem, but a problem insofar as perception. You can look at it like this. You know, um, skill, any skill or any domain of knowledge, it's like a vast mountain. And you have to walk up the mountain to be able to, um, I don't know, have expertise or mastery. You can think of expertise or mastery as a mountain. You need to walk up this thing, and you don't become a master or an expert until you get to the peak and to the top of this mountain. Or at least to the peak and to the top of where everyone else before you has uh, at least gone. You have to get to where the highest predecessor ended in your field and if you don't get there you're not gonna you're not gonna be a genius I'm sorry if you don't uh, master all the things that came before you it's just gonna be really hard okay and so it's it's for this reason that I say that even if you give them the tools you don't give the person the expertise that's necessary for them to actually come up with a seminal breakthrough part of coming up with a seminal breakthrough is the problem it's the person and it's the expertise, but you need all three of them there. You can get, you can give somebody all the tools you want. The you can give somebody all the thinking tools you want. You you can do that. You can teach them negative uh, thought patterns. You can teach them to look for. Uh, I mean, I don't know everything that they teach these people to look for, but they have a they have a toolkit. They call it the genius toolkit. At least this one woman calls it the genius toolkit. You can very well hand somebody a genius toolkit, but that's not going to make them a genius because to actually be able to understand what Einstein understood would require you to know all the relevant information Einstein knew. And if you're not even knowing what Einstein knew is not going to help you in this situation solving this new and novel problem because Einstein already solved the problem he solved. This problem is not the same problem that Einstein solved. This problem is unique and a wholly different creature. Doing what Einstein did is not going to help you with this thing. It may help you get to the, uh, it may help you approximate yourself and get the to the relevant space to where you can maybe um, assimilate the new tools and um, schemata that you need to solve this problem. But sorry, man, doing what happened before is not going to get you what is totally new. It's just not. I mean, I don't know, but it. Logically, it just seems like that doesn't work. Maybe empiricism, empiricism will prove me wrong because the, this is a, a completely, um, well, it's not completely, but it's mainly a structural critique. So it's logic based and not necessarily empirically based. I'm using empiricism to uh, justify my claims and uh, support the warrants I'm making, but that doesn't mean it's 100% uh, true. So take that for what it's worth and it's just an idea but that's why I don't agree with can, uh, that genius can be taught uh, anyways thank you